This webinar will be presented by the Division of Blood Disorders at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, probably more familiar to most of us as the CDC. My name is Greg Curio. I'm a pediatric cardiologist and an associate clinical professor of pediatrics at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospitals in both San Francisco and Oakland in Northern California. I'm really, really honored to be with everybody today at, to moderate today's webinar where we're going to take a deeper look at the role of the heart in thalassemia. So before we get started, uh, before I introduce our, our illustrious guest presenter, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping details before joining the webinar. Upon joining, you're gonna see two audio options, and one's going to be to listen on your personal device via speakers or, the, or connected headphones, or you can use your phone to connect to the audio. If you do choose the phone option, the webinar toolbar that you see on your screen is going to provide you with the phone and access number as well as a pin for audio. So uh, make your choice in terms of what's going to be the most stable for you. And just to let you know, all the attendees will be automatically muted as you come in. At the end of the presentation, we're going to have a Q&A. And if you want to submit a written question, there's a questions section in the toolbar and we'll try to respond to as many questions as we can, uh, time permitting, before the end of the webinar. And we, we've allotted about an hour to, to discuss this with uh, Dr. Wood giving uh, our, our key presentation. And please note that this will be a recorded session. So we'd like to kick off today's festivities with a couple of brief audience participation polls. There's no pressure, but we're interested in knowing a little bit more about you. So take a few seconds, maybe 15, 20 seconds, select your response to this poll question first, and we'll have another one to follow. So this is, this is really great, and, and uh, thanks everyone for joining, but lots of healthcare providers giving care to our thalassemia patients, but really, really great to have the public health professionals and also our patients or family members with thalassemia. So I, I think this is not unexpected, really good balance. So let's take a look at the next uh, poll question. So take 10, 15 seconds to tell us where you're from. Great, thank you so much for doing that. So looks like we have a really good balance from throughout the, the earth, really. So I probably should have started with good morning, afternoon, and evening, wherever you are. But thanks, everyone, for joining. And especially if it's really, really late or really, really early in your part of the world, especially thank you for joining. So great. I think now we should uh, move on with our presentation. It is really my distinct pleasure to introduce today's presenter, who is Dr. John Wood, who many of you have heard of, read, met, who is a renowned expert in the area of heart imaging, hemoglobinopathies, and really my personal mentor and colleague in these pursuits. Uh, Dr. Wood directs the Cardiovascular Magnetic Resonance Imaging Laboratory at the Saban Research Institute in Los Angeles. This laboratory has pioneered the use of MRI to detect and quantitate tissue iron in patients who have developed iron overload, ostensibly really largely due to needs for chronic red blood cell transfusions. So thus, those of us who work in this field owe Dr. Wood and his lab really a large debt because that work is the basis for the assessments that have become the backbone of, of cardiac care and really whole body care for these mm -hmm. thalassemia patients. Dr. Wood also serves as professor in both the departments of pediatrics and radiology at the Keck School of Medicine, uh, which is within the University of Southern California. And as you probably already gleaned, his clinical interests are in the advanced imaging assessment of congenital heart disease, as well as cardiomyopathy, particularly that due to iron overload, and really using the latest techniques in MRI as well as echo to, to do this. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Wood, take it away. You have the floor. Well, thank you, Greg, for that uh, kind introduction. And I want to thank the CDC and Cooley's Anemia Foundation for the invitation. And uh, let's see, click there. And this should be my disclosures. Let's see, not having control of the screen yet. So, there we go. Okay, there are my disclosures. Um, and these are the four basic topics that I want to, to cover today. 
starting with a cardiologist view of uh, hematology, which is quite simplified. This schematic reflects the maturation of red blood cells from the bone marrow units all the way to mature red blood cells. The degree of the transition from blue to red represents the degree of hemoglobinization along the developmental pathway. And um, hemoglobin has two alpha and beta subunits to support the heme moiety. And genetic deficiencies that lead to imbalances in these uh, subunits cause the red cells to prematurely die in this pathway. And the severity of that defect is really what determines whether a patient is a thalassemia intermediate patient or a thalassemia major patient. Um, and the spectrum of the heart disease varies dramatically with um, the uh, level of uh, effective versus ineffective erythropoiesis. It turns out that in all of us, only 75% of the precursors make it all the way to um, mature red blood cells, but in some of the severe thalassemia syndromes, that number can fall to as low as 10 to 15%. Well, if the defect is incomplete, some patients will be able to maintain a hemoglobin greater than seven without additional therapies, and this uh, is called the thalassemia intermediate syndromes, or NTDT. And while this sounds great, um, what happens over time is generally the hemoglobin levels uh, fall further, and many of these patients, and the complications resulting from the low hemoglobins rise with age in the thalassemia intermediate group. And some of them become transfusion dependent later in life. Um, and the chronic anemia does lead to inadequate oxygen delivery to many organs in the body. And the most oxygen sensitive are actually the heart uh, and the brain. Um, in addition, the, in trying to keep up with red cell production, uh, there's growth and expansion of the bone marrow, both within the bones and extramedullary hematopoiesis. And these have pretty significant negative health consequences. In addition, the developing red cell precursors make many uh, vascular factors uh, that interact unfavorably with the blood vessels of the body. These factors include a placentally derived growth factor and other pro-inflammatory cytokines. In addition, the activity of these red cell precursors leads to suppression of the iron counter-regulatory hormone hepcidin. And this causes constitutive iron absorption from the diet, producing a condition that is completely analogous to hereditary hemochromocytosis that ultimately will lead to um, not only liver iron deposition, but also cardiac iron deposition, usually in the 30s or 40s. There are some other complications of thalassemia intermedia. Uh, the most common are venous thromboses and pulmonary embolisms, pulmonary hypertension, as well as abnormalities of elastic arteries in the body. When the genetic defect in red cell synthesis is too severe, blood cell transfusions are required lifelong to sustain life, and this is called thalassemia major. Now, if you are able to maintain a pre-transfusion hemoglobin above nine and a half, this is generally very effective at suppressing ineffective erythropoiesis and can, can negate many of those negative conse cardiac consequences seen in thalassemia intermediate syndromes. However, it is really translating one disease into another, which is that of iron overload. And iron has direct toxic effects on the heart muscle and the vasculature, but it also has critically important indirect effects acting through the endocrine system because there are many, many hormones in the body that support cardiac function. 
So let's turn to that consequence of iron cardiomyopathy. In thalassemia intermedia, this is rare and occurs much later in life, but in transfusion-dependent you know, thalassemia major, iron builds up in the body incredibly rapidly. So the liver is the dominant iron storage, storage organ of the body, and it has an iron concentration of one milligram per gram. Each transfusion will essentially raise that liver iron by one milligram per gram. Furthermore, the body eliminates only one transfusion's worth of iron per year. So if you're being transfused every three weeks, you can see that by the end of only one year of transfusions, you're going to have a liver iron that's up around 17, 18 milligrams per gram, which is well into the range thought to be cardiotoxic. Now, what happens to those red blood cells when they've been transfused into the body? Well, they age like all red blood cells, and eventually they're scavenged by the reticuloendothelial macrophages in the spleen and liver, and the iron that's in them is almost 100% recycled into the bloodstream as non-transferrin bound iron. This is a very toxic form of iron. Fortunately, the body, the liver, makes an iron chelator that's called transferrin. And transferrin rapidly soaks up that iron and shuttles most of it back to the bone marrow for making new red blood cells. The excess iron is taken off to the liver for long-term storage, and the liver has a high capacity for storing iron relatively safely. Uh, transferrin-bound iron also goes to all of the cells in the body, which have transferrin receptors. And they, but these are very tightly regulated processes, and you can't iron overload the heart or any organ through transferrin-bound iron. However, if the ability, if the liver becomes damaged for any reason, or if just the burden of transfusions are too high compared to the utilization by the bone marrow, then the uh, transferrin being released by the liver cannot keep up. And the, you start to form these non-transferrin-bound iron species again. These enter constitutively through divalent metal channels, both into the liver, into and into the heart and endocrine glands where they cause the damage. Schematically, this can be thought of as the transferrin being a gigantic tank, and transfusions are the iron load going in, and the effective use of transferrin-bound iron by the bone marrow is the drain. And as long as those remain in balance, then there's no overflow to spill into the heart. But anything which um, leads, tips it toward overflowing um, can lead to cardiac iron overload. And as I mentioned, this is, for example, an increase in transfusion volume, um, a decrease of the effective use of red blood cells by the bone marrow, as well as damage to the liver. That will tip toward heart iron loading. And on the other side, obviously, effective erythropoiesis is incredibly protective. Turns out inflammation is slightly protective because it tends to lock iron within the reticuloendothelial system. And hemolysis is slightly protective as well because it is a hemolyzed iron is eliminated through the kidney into the urine and is a, a novel source of iron loss. But, but using this sort of teeter-totter, we can rate the anemias in terms of their intrinsic cardiac risk with the non-transfused uh, anemias on the right-hand side of the panel, and Black Sun Diamond Syndrome being the worst of the worst because there is zero utilization of transferrin bound iron by the bone marrow. And I've seen hard iron in Black Sun Diamond children as young as three years of age. Now, obviously, there is an interaction between this intrinsic use uh, risk and what the uh, patient actually is doing with their iron chelation. So this schematic represents a patient taking deferocyrox therapy seven days a week. The green is the safe level of NTBI or LPI. I have used those terms somewhat interchangeably. And, um, but, um, and in that situation, even though he's at risk, he or she, they he won't develop heart and endocrine iron. 
With respect to the liver, the liver ion concentration is determined by the number of grams of iron delivered by transfusion and essentially the grams of chelator being taken. But fortunately, the hematologist will adjust the dose based on the liver iron to achieve a safe level. Now let's consider that very same patient who goes off to college and joins a fraternity and you know what happens. This chelation pattern starts to look like this. And now you see that the labile plasma iron level is spending a lot of time in the red zone. And that's when iron is going into the heart and endocrine gland. Now he goes home, is seen by his hematologist. He says, oh, because now the liver iron will also start to go up because there's fewer grams of chelator going in. And maybe he thinks that the dose is being outgrown and increases the dose. Well, what's going to happen in this situation is the liver iron will be perfectly balanced, but the heart is still seeing an awful lot of time with the, in an unfavorable zone, and heart and pancreas iron will continue to go up on this regimen. So the bottom line is that the liver cares about the grams of chelator you take per week. But what the heart cares about is the number of days per week that you take your iron chelator. It's the duration of exposure that is important for the heart. And why I say this is this example occurs all the time that patients develop cardiac iron despite having a safe level of, cardi of liver iron. And this slide depicts that. We have had serial monitoring of patients since 2003 and we've seen 23 patients go from a clean heart to a dirty heart. This graph basically depicts the liver iron at which they made that transition. And I've broken it down into a low risk, an intermediate risk, and a high risk zone. And obviously some of the patients who got heart iron had high liver iron, we expected it, we tried, you know. But 30% of these patients had liver irons that were thought to be perfectly safe. And so, the answer here is, there, while a high liver iron is always bad and should be treated, a low liver iron is no guarantee of protection. It's how many days per week that people are taking their drug. Now, because of this um, sneaky loading of the heart, it's essential to have cardiac MRI to detect asymptomatic iron loading of the heart. And this is the first study that validated the cardiac T2 star as a biomarker. This is a plot of left ventricular ejection fraction on the Y versus heart T2 star on the X axis. A high T2 star means low iron. And you can see that all of the patients who have a T2 star greater than 20 milliseconds have normal ejection fraction. But as you get below that threshold, there's a higher and higher probability of developing left ventricular dysfunction. Now, the astute observer will say yes, but there are many patients who have evidence of heart iron but have normal function. What happens to them? And there was a follow-up registry study that addressed that question, and this graph represents the proportion of patients who developed congestive heart failure as a function of time over a one-year period. And what they showed was that if your T2 star was better than 10 milliseconds, your chance was really, really low. But as it fell below 10 milliseconds, it went up to 50% if your T2 star was less than 6 milliseconds. So a T2 star less than 10 milliseconds is a, is a red zone and should demand immediate and significant escalation of, of iron chelation therapy. Now, you might also ask, well, how is it that a heart can have iron in it, be, but be perfectly, apparently healthy? Um, and the answer is um, because the heart has an internal chelation system. This depicts a heart cell, and the labile iron goes into the heart through divalent metal channels, but the heart has ferritin within it that binds up that free iron, so there's even when the T2 star is abnormal, there is uh, no, often no free iron within the heart. That ferritin-bound iron has a weak T2 star signature, 
but it is taken down and broken up into lysosomes into hemosiderin, which is a very powerful T2 star um, effect. But if this process continues on too long or reaches too severe a level, what happens is the buffering capacity of ferritin is exceeded. And at that point, we start to see those free iron species again, but this time inside the heart cell. And inside the heart cell, where do they go? They go and poison the mitochondria, and so you get LV dysfunction. They go and interfere with the ion channels of the heart, so you get really nasty arrhythmias. And they also lead to um, secretion of factors that promote fibrosis by cardiac stellate cells. So three very bad things that happen over time. And the risk is related. So cardiac T2 star is measuring stored iron, but it is measuring the potential for the labile toxic iron that causes all the mischief. And it is some combination of severity and time that really determines cardiac risk. See, I'm not advancing. Hopefully we'll advance. Could I advance to the next slide, please? Can we have a slide advance, yeah, please? Sorry, one more slide, yeah. There. Yeah, please advance. Uh, we're frozen on the screen here. Oh no. Can you? And Greg is frozen too. Greg, are you yeah, are you able to I'm see the slides? Greg? Slides advance. So. Ah, uh, okay. So it is on yeah, me. I, it is my internet connection. Oh, that is problematic. Um, because I need to be able to see the slides. Um, okay. How do I reconnect? View the internet. Um. Let's. Okay, see. my connection has been reestablished. Wonderful. There we go. Okay. All right, so, all right, there we go. Sorry, let me try and get back on track, folks. Sorry. Sorry for going too far. Thank you, everyone, for your That's patience. Okay. Yep, all right, here we are. So, okay, now, what ha this slide depicts the mortality in 2000 up to the year 2000 in the United Kingdom before the advent of the cardiac MRI. And shortly after the introduction of cardiac MRI, um, this was the improvement. So red reflects the cardiac deaths. And you can see the drop in cardiac deaths just by, um, the, improve, by the ability to see iron developing within the heart. And, um, and it makes sense because if you've ever tried to drive a car with your eyes closed or opening your eyes every 10 seconds, um, you realize this ability to look ahead and see iron before it, you're at the point of death is, is really critical. Now, what do we do when we do hit the situation of uh, cardiomyopathy? It's rare, but it still occurs. This got consens AHA consensus guideline was published in 2011, and it's still got the state of the art. Um, and I recommend it to anyone who knows someone who's having heart problems, their physicians, their ICU docs, they should read this document because it spells out the physiology and the processes. And I'm only gonna touch on it very briefly the key is the actual removal of iron, which should be done by 24-7 uh, administration of deferoxamine um, with deferoprone added when oral is tolerated. And uh, the other key point is that the, you're not going to remove all of the hard iron, but you can control that toxic iron fraction after about two to eight weeks of therapy. But it is critically important to remind the ICU physician that no matter how bad that heart looks, I don't care if the ejection fraction is unmeasurable, it will get better if you can keep the rest of the organs of the body alive long enough. That can be challenging, but, if, but they need to keep going because the heart will recover and it will recover completely. Um, you know, with that said, it's very, very important that they use as little support as possible. Um, all of these inotropes 
create stress, oxidative stress within the heart, which worsens the effect of iron overload. So the less is more principle applies to all aspects of this. Um, and the uh, other key thing is that all of the endocrine glands are affected if the heart is full of iron and these need to be um, supported. Obviously, the best treatment for cardiomyopathy is the prevention of cardiomyopathy in the first place. And as I showed you, it's this compliance, this daily chelator that is essential in controlling and protecting the heart. Um, there is potentially a role for calcium channel blockade. There have been several randomized control studies that show that you can partially block the entry of iron into the heart using um, amlodipine. And for established iron in the heart, uh, deferoprone is more effective than intermittently dosed deferoxamine or deferocyrox. But honestly, when there is significant cardiac iron, I highly recommend combined therapies uh, as being more effective than monotherapy. So now turning on to uh, pulmonary hypertension. If you look through the literature, the prevalence of pulmonary hypertension varies wildly among the different centers. And the reason for that is that splenectomy is, an, is a very strong risk factor. And splenectomy practices um, are quite center dependent. The other thing is that the risk of pulmonary hypertension increases with age. It increases with the anemia severity. Therefore, transfusion practices also are a very powerful mediator of pulmonary hypertension risk. So um, as you might expect, uh, most thalassemia intermediate patients are more anemic and have splenectomy, so they are at the highest risk of pulmonary hypertension. It does occur in well-transfused thalassemia major, but it's quite rare. So I like to think, to use this equation when thinking about pulmonary hypertension. It's a combination of abnormal mechanical forces and vasoconstriction. The mechanical forces are driven primarily by the anemia itself, which interact and raise the, the shear stress as well as the pulmonary artery circumferential stress on that heart. Um, this is a sort of the back pressure. Um, also, any impairment of the left ventricular relaxation, which happens over time in thalassemia, leads to increases in left atrial pressure and pulmonary hypertension. But the more powerful forces are actually the vasoconstrictive forces. The ineffective erythropoiesis releases three toxic substances to the vasculature. The first is that it promotes iron absorption and uh, and circulating iron, which is toxic to vascular endothelium. The second is that placentally derived growth factor promotes macrophage recru uh, recruitment and vascular inflammation. And the third thing is that red cell fragments and microparticles, these, many of these contain heme or hemoglobin within them, um, which is a powerful vasoconstrictor. Fortunately, the spleen cleans up most of those, but if you're splenectomized, those pass on to stress the pulmonary vascular uh, endothelium. Now, the liver is an important comorbidity, um, and liver dysfunction is common with iron overload or hepatitis C infection. And the liver acts by clearing vasoactive substances from the blood. So, um, and, and frankly, any patient with liver disease can get pulmonary hypertension just from the liver dysfunction itself. The other key modulator is the lung. So thalassemia patients are chronically hypoxemic due to restrictive lung disease, some degree of ventilation perfusion mismatch in the lung, and as well as what they call pulmonary diffusion block, which is essentially from pulmonary fibrosis at the alveolar level. And ox hypoxemia is a pays powerful vasoconstrictive stimulus. Monitoring for pulmonary hypertension is fairly easy, fortunately. It can be done by echocardiogram uh, at one to three year intervals. And I, a TR velocity greater than 2.5 milliseconds is abnormal. 
It's not very abnormal, and most cardiologists don't consider the range of 2.5 to 3 pulmonary hypertension per se, but it is certainly a shot across the bowels and should not be ignored. By the time you get to a TR velocity greater than three milliseconds, um, if it's refractory to hematologic maneuvers, you should get your pulmonary hypertension specialist involved. So what are the therapies? Well, in this intermediate range, watchful waiting for one sample is, is reasonable. If you've been fine and then there's a random value of 2.7, it's fine to wait and see if it goes back to 2.5. But if you're persistently in that 2.5 to 2.9 range, that's suggesting early processes and that therapies that downregulate this ineffective erythral poiesis might be a benefit. Um, by the time you get to a TR velocity greater than three milliseconds, if this is a non-transfused patient, they should absolutely be placed on regular transfusion, just the same regimen as a thalassemia major patient. We have reversed, completely reversed significant pulmonary hypertension by early initiation of chronic transfusion therapy uh, in patients. Failing those two measures, um, then we are talking uh, about pulmonary hypertensive medications. Sildenafil turns out to be fairly effective in this type of pulmonary hypertension. It, um, but if, if the response is incomplete, usually the next line of therapy is an endothelin re uh, receptor blocker. Um, and rarely do you have to escalate to um, higher order uh, prostaglandin derivatives. So lastly, I'd like to finish with a discussion of vascular aging. So we are victims of our own success. I showed you the drop in cardiac de deaths and thalassemia patients are living longer, but we're now seeing a new cardiac phenotype, which is characterized by diastolic dysfunction of the left ventricle, atrial dilation, atrial fibrillation, and low cardiac output. And this happens to people without thalassemia all the time. And it has a name, it's called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or HEFTEF for short. So um, the uh, risk factors in thalassemia include diabetes, hepatitis C, myocardial scarring, and previous iron overload. And this just is a schematic from the uh, Myot network, which shows heart failure on the vertical as a function of, a, of uh, time of observation. The red is classic iron cardiomyopathy, but the blue is the prevalence of HEFPEF. <laughs> and you can see right now, it's about a quarter of the total heart failure, um, uh, cases of heart failure. And there are, but it, this is institution dependent. There was a report from Sicily in which 15 of the, new, of the last 16 cases of heart failure presenting at their institution had preserved ejection fraction with very little evidence of cardiac iron and most of these patients were presenting with right ventricular dysfunction. And there's another great paper out of the Greek group uh, showing that the, the root cause is diastolic dysfunction, atrial dilation and atrial fibrillation. And this occurs in thalassemia patients just like it occurs in uh, normal people, but it's occurring about uh, 20 years earlier. And you know, to personalize this a little bit, these are MRIs from our institution in asymptomatic patients um, and uh, at three different decades of life. The key parameter here is this left atrial size, which is enlarged in all of these patients out of proportion to their anemia and their age. The bottom, panel, bottom line here indicates their cardiac index. Um, and a range of 2.5 to 4 is normal. And I think you can appreciate that in the early patients, it's right down the middle of normal. But in the older patients, um, it's at the very lower limit of normal. And what I can tell you is that these MRIs would be perfectly normal if you added 15 to 20 to the age that's on that page. So this is just an acceleration of the normal aging process. And what is this process? Well, it's not, it's being studied very actively. 
because it's common in non-thalassemia patients. The initial problem appears to be this left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. This raises the left atrial pressure, which in turn causes back pressure on the pulmonary arteries and pulmonary hypertension. That then makes the right heart work hard and uh, give up the ghost a little bit earlier. And in turn, that there is crosstalk between the right ventricle and the left ventricle, both through the interventricular septum and through pericardial constraint, <laughs> that, leads, that further reinforces this whole bad cycle. And ultimately, there's increases in right atrial pressure and release of the hormones AMP and BNP, which promote water uh, uh, and secondary water absorption. But what is the proximate cause? What's happening at a molecular level? There are really three things that apparently cause HEFPEF. They are microvascular inflammation and dysfunction. And I've already shown you that in thalassemia, there's a bunch of reasons uh, why that microvas the microvasculature is stressed. And um, the second is that the heart muscle itself doesn't metabolize its fuels properly. And there's two, pro two reasons in thalassemia that that may be going on. Number one is that type 2 diabetes is incredibly common in older patients with thalassemia, and that uh, impairs fuel metabolism through insulin resistance. And the second thing is that there's probably some poisoning of the mitochondria directly through even mild iron accumulation. The last factor that contributes to LV diastolic dysfunction is cardiac fibrosis, which we can document by MRI is present in thalassemia patients as they age. And that fibrosis stiffens the heart and uh, causes this dysfunction. So um, how do we best protect the heart in thalassemia? Well, number one, we have to keep iron out of the heart in the first place. And that is really by uh, strict completion compliance and regular MRI mo monitoring. And we are still struggling in this country to, de to deploying MRI moder monitoring on a routine basis. Um, the second thing, and I really want to emphasize this, we can't just focus on the heart iron. By the time the heart is loaded, I didn't show this data, but by the time the heart is loaded, the pituitary is fried, and the pancreas is badly wounded. We don't want to wait for that. We want to be ahead of the game, and we want to be controlling the labile iron species 24-7 from the moment they get transfusions so that we're not damaging all of these vital support participants to the heart. <clears throat> um, for pulmonary hypertension, the key is, uh, is eliminating splenectomy even if you have to reduce the spleen to a very small amount, a partial splenectomy is better than a complete splenectomy. And we can't forget about it, have to keep screening. Um, I do think some of the new medications that modify inefferective erythral poiesis maybe have therapeutic benefit in lessening the risk of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, that remains to be proven, that is only a hypothesis, but I, suppressing ineffective erythral poiesis will be beneficial. Um, and, I, and we still have patients who are running around with chronic hepatitis, even though we have good drugs. So we need to eliminate chronic hepatitis um, in patients. And lastly, we have to remember that exercise, diet, and good metabolic control is not just for people who don't have thalassemia. It's as essential as in them, very more essential. So good basic heart health is... Uh, can really help thalassemia patients re reach a ripe old age. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, John. That was an amazing presentation. And uh, for those of you joining late, now we don't have to wait for the raucous applause. Uh, Dr. John Wood from the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles and USC. And I'm Greg Carrillo from UCSF. Uh, Benioff Children's Hospitals in Oakland and San Francisco. Right now, I'd like to proceed to some questions, and some really good questions have come in. Again, if you want to submit a question further, go to the questions area in your control toolbar, and you should be able to type it in at that point. 
So I wanted to start, John, with a couple of clinical questions that came up that I think um, are on a lot of people's minds. And first, in the course of transfusing these patients, um, are we recommending or are we using as a protocol uh, the freshest our PRBCs? So are we using, are, do we have a date mm -hmm. cutoff on our PRBCs, like 14 days or something like that? Yes, and the, you know, that is a very good question. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, the most important thing is the, um, uh, extent, the extended matching, uh, antigen matching, which is available in most places in the United States and most thalassemia centers, but at satellite hospitals, the extended cross match is not always done. Um, I mean, the fresher the, fresher the blood, the better. Um, there is no doubt about that. That has to be balanced with the availability of supply. Um, <clears throat> so if it's me and my body, yes, I want the blood that was donated yesterday, um, tempered by the practical aspects of what your blood bank can pull off. The red, red blood cells, when they're stored, um, they lose vital support um, nutrients and they, it changes their oxygen affinity um, and affects their survival. So in general, younger, fresher blood is always better, but external factors often govern this. Thank you, thank you. That's, that's a great answer to that. And there's a question about um, two, two things with MTHFR gene variants mm -hmm. and, and folate moiety. Um, supplementation. Do you think there's a potential for people with MTHFR, so that's methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase gene variants, mm -hmm. to have iron overload? And then the follow-up would be, do you think that, that some sort of folate supplementation might be protective or minimize iron overload? Boy, I do not know if the MTFR by itself predisposes in any way to uh, iron absorption. I can tell you that we looked at vitamin <clears throat> deficiencies in thalassemia patients, and many of the B vitamins were low. Um, and it makes sense because if you're turning red blood cells over like crazy, any cofactors which are responsible for red cell production will also be turned over um, very quickly. So we have something at uh, Children's Hospital Los Angeles that we call the veggie panel that is run every year that basically looks at all of the, these levels and we adjust our vitamin supplementation based on uh, those levels. And <clears throat> it isn't always just folate, but um, uh, the, uh, you know, certainly the, that is one of the uh, cofactors that we follow. Yeah, it was an interesting question, it kind of caught my attention and uh, I didn't, didn't have a straight answer for it as well. Um, and one experience question here, have you seen elevated liver enzymes with the BID dosing of deferoprone versus the TID dosing? Mm -hmm. You know, that's a good question. We have always done TID dosing at Children's, so I can't say. Um, the problem is trying to interpret um, liver iron bumps in anyone who's chronically transfused is iron overload will bump your liver enzymes. Um, you know, with DID dosing, if you just take TID drug and divide it in two equal doses so that your peak levels are higher, you could potentially envision in some people that you might, they might be more vulnerable to hepatic toxicity. Um, the benefits of them getting their full iron chelation in the day have to be balanced because uh, a lot of people have trouble with that three times a day. And if they're skipping them, their noon dose, I'd rather take my chances with liver iron uh, enzymes or liver enzymes than cardiac iron loading. Um, but yes, I think it's reasonable to be screening LFTs in anyone on BID uh, deferoprone dosing, just like you screen with LFTs for um, deferocyrox dosing, because you can definitely, we've definitely seen a lot of liver enzyme problems with the ferrocyrox. Um, it, it's a known complication. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, here's a question that actually I think a lot of people are curious about. Uh, I think it deals with really the optimal screening and cardiac testing interval for our patients that are well chelated and on into adulthood mm -hmm. where they've had a lifetime of, of transfusion experience and echo versus MRI in and at what interval. And then the follow-up question came through, what if I can't get a T2 star at my institution? Okay. All right. Well, so I think the uh, echo is never a replacement for cardiac MRI, sadly. Um, I'm an echocardiographer first, but the only thing echo can tell you is when the heart is actually sick, and that is much further down the toxicity pipeline than when the heart has iron in it. You have to make a much more dramatic turn if once you have left ventricular dysfunction, there is more lasting damage after you have, after you have demonstrated dysfunction. And frankly, echo is a pretty insensitive way of detecting uh, dysfunction. I had a study, a longitudinal study in thalassemia where I would walk people down from the echo lab to the MRI. And the number of times I had a normal echo took them down to the MRI and it was mildly abnormal. And, but that allowed us to respond more aggressively, escalate therapy and get folks well away from the danger zone when the echo said they were fine. So, um, so it's not a substitute. If you can't get it at your institution, get on the phone, call Cooley's Anemia and let them work for you in trying to find opportunities across the country where you might be able to get a T2 star done. They are wizards in that. So um, if you're not part of Cooley's, join Cooley's and get, use their resources. Um, the interval depends on the risk. And um, we actually, I didn't have time to present this, we look at the pancreas as well as the heart because the pancreas is the so-called canary in the coal mine. If your pancreas is clean, your heart is always clean, 100% of the time. So if I have someone who's lifelong compliant, their pancreas hasn't even loaded, I can space out the cardiac iron loading review. In fact, I might not even do a cardiac T2 star in that patient. I might just follow their liver and pancreas. Once the pancreas starts to get dirty, then I screen every one to two years, no matter how compliant they are, or say they are, because as I showed you, you can get cardiac iron with a liver iron that is normal. And so I need to have that touchstone. Um, I, um, and uh, yeah, so that, that's what I do. Great, totally agree. And at the risk of losing my American Society of Echocardiography card, I, yeah, totally 100% in agreement. And I think for those of us that don't, uh, do that much MRI, the issues with with uh, pancreatic scanning and versus cardiac scanning is the heart has that really annoying characteristic that it keeps moving and, and figuring out your ROIs can be a little bit troublesome. But I think that guidance for the pancreatic uh, scan is fantastic. Um, the next question is a fairly quick one, but I think a very informative one. Does alpha thalassemia uh, cause iron accumulation in the heart and, and other organs, and just kind of commenting on the differences between our alpha thal patients and our beta thal patients. Sure. So obviously there are many gradations of alpha thalassemia, and um, sure, it, it ultimately comes down to the severity of the anemia. So um, the, once your hemoglobin starts to fall below 10, then the bone marrow really revs up. It's really about nine and a half. The bone marrow revs up a lot. And it's that revving up of the bone marrow to try and replace hemoglobin that tells the liver not to make hepcidin. And that's the counter-regulatory hormone of the gut. And the gut says, okay, time to absorb iron. So it, it really depends. And, and with alpha thalassemia, you can have someone who's a Hemoglobin is 12, they're, they're not going to get iron overload, but you can have some that push down below 10, and they do. Um, and then there's 
alpha thalassemia with constant spring, and some of them are as severe as thalassemia major, and yes, they get cardiac iron. Um, so it's a whole spectrum um, driven by that sort of cascade that I showed in my very first slide. Yep, thanks, John. Um, and I guess a follow-up to the, the chelation BID, TID question, is deferoprone three times a day that formulation more effective than a twice a day formulation? Um, I have not seen any head to head comparison between the two to, um, to answer that question. Um, deferoprone acts differently than deferocyrox. Deferocyrox gets into the bloodstream, it binds to, to plasma proteins. And it basically acts like transferrin. It sits in the bloodstream and soaks up free iron. And it's really good at protecting iron from ever going into the heart in the first place. It's not all that good at removing iron from the heart. It will, but it takes a long, long time. So it's a great protection drug and less useful in, in removing established iron. The deferopone has a very short half-life. And when you take it, it washes into the heart at very high levels, and then it washes out, kind of like the tide coming in and coming out. And um, so I don't know if two bigger tides removes less or more iron than three tides in a day. And um, I don't think I've seen that comparison ever performed. Great, thank you. And there's a follow-up question to the um, the screening and follow-up echo versus MRI question. And I think, would you ever replace echo completely by MR? And, and my response to that kind of goes back to your, your TR jet uh, distinction. And there are some echo ways to do diastolic dysfunction that we're mm -hmm. still vetting in MRI, at least with, with our lab. But um, I think I wouldn't replace echo completely. There is a role for it, but uh, the question is, uh, what would you do there? Well, you, you actually uh, stole my, my answer, and it was beautiful. <laughs> I totally agree. MRI is better for addressing, is the only way to address iron cardiomyopathy. Um, but these other two conditions that I presented, pulmonary hypertension and HEFPEF, or, uh, those are as answered very well by ECHO, and, um, and in fact, better than by MRI. So um, I would rec I gave the range as one to three years for, for ECHO screening. That would be every three years for thalassemia major, which has a fairly low risk of pulmonary hypertension. However, if you have thalassemia intermedia, I think you should get an ECHO every year. You don't need a cardiac MRI every year, no way. Um, the, your risk of cardiac iron loading as a thalassemia or intermediate patient is quite low. Um, and so you might need a cardiac MRI every three to five years, but, um, but you really should get that echo every year. And it's kind of the opposite for thalassemia major. <laughs> yeah, great. That's a, really, that's a really important point in distinction. And uh, one of the follow-up questions to what you just said about the pancreas as the canary in the coal mine. Um, how can you tell if the pancreas is quote unquote dirty? Can you comment on some differences in evaluation of iron loading of the pancreas versus the heart by MR? Sure. Um, and the pancreas, unfortunately, is not as widely studied um, or utilized in clinical centers. There are many centers, good centers, that are still doing just the liver and the heart. Um, the pancreas can be measured by exactly the same techniques that are used in the liver. Um, the difficulty is, is a, a couple. One is that fat infiltrates the pancreas and makes it a little more challenging to quantitate the, cardia, uh, the pancreas T2 star. Um, I actually report not the T2 star of the pancreas, but the reciprocal of that, the transformation. You take the T2 star and you... 1,000 divided by the T2 star, that's your R2 star. That number has a meaning. Um, below 100 is low risk, above 100 is high risk. And, you know, honestly, if you can even get your local place to tell you there's no iron in the pancreas, 
there's a mild amount, there's a moderate amount, there's a severe amount, that would um, alone be helpful in, to your hematologist in potentially mod managing your therapies. Particularly the difference between none and some is a big one. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely agree. We're, we're coming up on time here, and I, I wanted to make sure we had a little bit of time to discuss something that's a little more, that's more timely in our current situation. What do we know about the experience of our thalassemia patients in the COVID pandemic? Have you seen patients with, with um, naturally acquired disease, whether acute or chronic? Have they had it, more cardiac issues like myocarditis with disease or with vaccine? That's a really good question. And I, <clears throat> we at our place, fortunately, knock on wood, all of our patients have done very well. I don't actually know of documented COVID. We were very aggressive at getting out and getting people vaccinated. Um, but um, in the literature, it, there is suggestion that patients with thalassemia and end organ involvement of some kind, some sort of end organ toxicity do do worse. Than, if, than, than just the average Joe on the street. Um, and so we firmly believe that everyone should be vaccinated to the full extent possible in their own region. Um, once vaccinated, there's no evidence that uh, breakthrough cases um, have claimed, there have been no reported loss of life uh, through breakthrough cases. And, and no report of increased myocarditis in thalassemia patients. Now, there's, there's a bit of a law of numbers. You know, it's a, thalassemia is rare enough. Post-vaccine myocarditis is rare enough. So there's not really enough numbers to say. But honestly, if it were my children, uh, I would rush them off to get vaccinated so fast it would make their head spin. And um, there is some some literature that has claimed that thalassemia trait um, is partially protected. I, I, it isn't very good data and I don't actually believe it, but we'll see. But that's irrelevant. If, if you have intermediate or you have major, you should, should get yourself vaccinated as fast as you can. Yeah, th thanks. I totally agree. We've been kind of making sure that message gets out and to the families of the patients and caregivers of the patients as well. I, I, that's kind of been our focus as well. So thanks for that. So I, I think we're at time and I'd really like to thank you, John, personally for the, this opportunity and having the chance to chat and collaborate again. I, I've really missed it over the years. And um, these, this information is so, so valuable for the care of these patients. I, I wanna thank everybody for registering, joining in for your questions and apologies that we didn't get to all of them uh, in, the, in the time allotted. We wanna thank our colleagues at the CDC in the Division of Blood Disorders for the invitation to present and, and join everybody today. And really also the Cooley's Anemia Foundation for hosting the webinar with us. And very shortly, everybody here is gonna receive an email asking for your feedback and we would greatly appreciate comments, feedback uh, on what you've just, uh, just seen and heard. If you have additional questions, as you see on the slide here, uh, you can contact Cynthia Sayers at the email address there, her C CDC address. And the webinar will later be archived um, and the content will be available at the CDC Division of Blood Disorders website. And I think that is also shown on the slide. So. With that, I think we are going to conclude and thank you everyone for attending. Thank you so much, John, the CDC, and uh, Cooley's Anemia Foundation for everything. And uh, have a great rest of your day.